I'll be talking about a bit of uh, because I, because of the audience is not necessarily uh, familiar with the particulars of what is a hizmet movement, what is different from an Islamic movement, what's happening in Turkey. I will try to make an introductory uh, definition of hizmet movement, its principles, a short history of hizmet movement, and we'll try to talk about the ongoing crisis in Turkey about the hizmet movement if that's okay. And uh, hopefully that will be uh, bring us to Q&A session. Now, um, the content would be, of course, we'll talk about what is the movement, its definition, its principles, emergence of the movement from a, a mosque congregation to a social movement that we are talking today relevant to, let's say, Lithuania and, and other countries. And of course, what has happened in the uh, 15th of July and its implications. Sorry, this might be a bit misleading. It's not necessarily what has happened in 15th of July, which we can discuss in the Q&A, but I will try to talk about how 15th of July has affected what exactly happened with the coup attempt in, in Turkey. So, I happen to see... Okay, that's fine. So in terms of what is Izmet movement, uh, last time I have discussed this with a group of uh, uh, Tanzanian uh, young graduates uh, and all 20 of them actually came up with a different definition. So they, have, they are familiar with Izmet movement, they know they have a definition of Izmet movement, and then we discussed the 21st definition. And this definition is basically uh, from my thesis uh, about the movement and, and it's based based on Fethullah Gülen and the way uh, the person who inspired his met movement and his definition. So, uh, first of all, what is his met movement? His met movement is a religiously inspired social movement which works around education, dialogue and charity activities, which I will ex explain. In the meantime, uh, if you can meet people who, who you know, like a there is any other host help me to mute people so I don't have to deal with that. Thank you very much. But sometimes people may mistakenly leave their mics on. Anyway, so, but uh, how that what we call Gulen movement or Hizmet movement came to be an education dialogue and charity oriented social movement from a mosque. It happened with the, with the definition actually. And Gulen's definition is, it is something is, is called a hizmet and, and that is mainly, let's say, promotion of moral values or good moral values or universal moral values, at least Islamic moral values, however you take it, that, that requires a separate, defini a separate definition. But the, actually, the way you do that makes the, the difference within the other movements or which allows us to differentiate his movement from the other movements. One of them is it should be compliant with the understanding of present time. Actually, the first one, according to Gulen, is his met movement, anything to be called his met, it should be compliant with the, with the understanding of the present time. This is what makes the movement a bit more modern oriented, meaning like the way it is understanding or implementation of Islam is a bit more modern, a bit more relevant, a bit more living in today. So anything that you do in the name of Hizmet should be okay or compliant with the understanding of the present current time. And the second uh, thing in the definition he highlights that it should, uh, the all Hizmet, all service, again, Hizmet means service, should be carried out according to Quranic principles of being just, fair, moderate, and consistent. These are the most uh, repeated uh, attributes in the Quran. So it has to be compliant with the Quranic principles of those principles and, and other Quranic principles as well. And the third one is to, to say, Gulen say, to avoid conflict with people who are working for the same cause, which means like, for instance, uh, Gulen is uh, defining a movement where uh, spending time with conflict, even that if that is related with uh, other people who are trying to do something else, you know, who are who can be your competitors or your rivals, you shouldn't go into conflict with them or con contradiction with them or fight with them and waste energy in that sense. But you shouldn't also 
uh, waste energy in terms of uh, with frictions within the movement or with similar kind people or with similar minded people, because all friction cause a waste of energy and that energy should be used positively. Uh, it's called positive uh, contribution. Everything you should do should, everything you do should contribute positively for your cause, for your aims, for your objectives. So uh, whilst you're doing that, you should, you should avoid as much as possible from conflict uh, with others and friction with your brothers, let's say in a shorter term, we can put it together. And another Hizmet principles is that uh, Gulen says that Hizmet should be logical and reasonable. It can be two different issue, but whatever you decide to do uh, in the name of Hizmet as a service, it should be logical, it should be explained, it should make sense and it should be reasonable. And again, this makes his met a bit more realistic on, on the ground. And it also asks to be focused rather than try to achieve everything at once. So his met people, you would find them working around projects rather than trying to do everything overall all the time, because that is within the uh, very definition of his met movement. And then also Gulen also thinks that any service should utilize the resources, seize the opportunities and try the to solve the problems of today with wisdom. So there is a trust in uh, or faith in God that tomorrow's problems will come with their own um, resources. So we should use today's resources and seize every opportunity that we have today to solve the problems of today, because that, that is our responsibility to solve the problems of today. And also whilst we're doing that, uh, that's the other principle is to utilize resources in the most efficient way. This, this ideally makes the Hizmet movement, uh, it, you know, in, in, it, as a definition, whilst we're doing this, also promoting the moral values within these criteria. But whilst we're doing that, Hizmet movement had a number of uh, principles emerged uh, that you see they act uh, or abide by those principles. And those principles, when you look at them closely, they are actually they are actually sourced either from religious sources, or uh, historical sources, or contextual sources. So I'll give some examples for this part to make it a bit more understandable. But we can think of them like the the the, the graph that I draw. Uh, for this purpose is, is like concentric circles. In the very center of the Hizmet movement is the religious uh, religious sources of principles, which I will give some explanation. That actually makes Hizmet movement Islamically originated or, or originated from Islam. But its actions might be a bit outside of the Islamic or religious sphere. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily always remain in there. But there is a huge amount of historical uh, sources that has influenced, especially the methods, the way of thinking, the way of acting uh, of Hizmet people. And then finally, the contextual uh, sources. I try to make this a bit more, let's say, uh, appealing to I, let's say. First of all, when we say Islamic uh, principles, at the core of Hizmet movement, there is that uh, to abide the Quranic principles that, you know, to stay away whatever Quran prohibit, like gossiping or killing or stealing from others or doing other wrong things, and also do whatever Quran uh, or Islam uh, ask a Muslim to do, like being just and fair to other, help the poor, feed the hungry, and all other good actions. So this is uh, why we have to always remember that his met movement in the core of it is a religious movement. It does everything for the sake of God to, to please him because he expressed himself in the Quran or in via the other holy books uh, that he, he wishes us to, he wishes to see us doing all these good things and avoid all those bad actions. And at the core of his met movement, this is about uh, all those principles that you can find su uh, summaries on the internet that what Quran asks, you know, like for instance, have uh, establish a good relationship with uh, relatives, not to cut ties with others. 
Anyway, so this is the first first part, and uh, the second, the, this is the a bit more chunkier area where I can actually talk and give examples, maybe ten, or or specifically I'll try to give examples because this is where a hizmet movement is a Turkish movement, or a, a post Ottoman movement in you know like in a in a different time, however you you frame it. You can see that a lot of uh, principles that actually uh, defines how something is being done, how something is being achieved, what methods should be used, or what motivations or what principles to 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 apply, is very much based on uh, some historical figures, and they are saying some Turkish proverbs, some Turkish historical facts, and other stuff. The in the big uh, picture, you can see uh, the famous uh, Sufi poet Mevlana Celaleddin Rumi, or in short, Rumi. Uh, for instance, Rumi has a huge influence on his met movement, although he's a Persian writer, or some even claim he's Persian, but he has a huge influence in Turkey in terms of his, his legacy. And one of that is, for instance, that it makes sense for a lot of people when they are fundraising, is you can see they often quote one of his poetry where he says, uh, th uh, those who people should be generous like rivers and humble like earth and uh, be like a knight when covering the mistakes. Sort of in these various attributes, but the, the, about the generosity when in giving, uh, be like river, Rumi says. And, and it makes sense for a lot of Turkish people who is in a fundraising sohbet or a gathering where the, the, the person who is trying to convince people to support certain projects brings out this principle from Mevlana Celaleddin Rumi, and then you shall give like a river is flowing and, and you know, act, be very generous because there is no calculation, there is no holding back in a river's flow and stuff. But it may not make the same impact on, let's say, an Indian Islamic, uh, let's say, a Deobandi Islamic understanding, because uh, what you have to give is prescribed in Islam. You don't have to give more than that. It's better if you give more than that, but it's very much measured, you know, uh, and every, the Ramadan is coming in the next month. And what you have to give is 2.5% uh, of, of your surplus wealth, uh, some, anything apart from your essentials. And that is well calculated and zakat is this and this is that. So that may not necessarily translate in every culture very successfully, but this is where his met movement and it is, let's say, uh, heritage of giving comes uh, from Rumi's principle. And it is very much recited among the members of his met movement to, to explain or to, to encourage each other to do some good, good deed or, or support certain activities. So Rumi is uh, one of the most quoted person in both Nursi's and, and mainly Fethullah Gulen's articles. So we'll come back to that. But there is another in the right top corner uh, the old gentleman is Saidi Nursi. Saidi Nursi is actually maybe the most uh, influential person on today's Hizmet movement, apart from Fethullah Gulen. He just lived in the early Republican era when Atatürk was alive and uh, when the uh, late uh, Ottoman period and early Republican era. And he has seen many wars and many other problems. And he has principles that shaped Hizmet movement a lot. Like for instance, you shall always seek the, the pleasure of God. In every action, you should seek the pleasure of God. Uh, you shall know your strength in, 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 in your sincerity, not in your numbers. And, and many other principles, like every other week, uh, a Hizmet member should be uh, constantly reading. I think there is 10 principles like that. But throughout his books, he has so many ways that uh, teaches people how to approach or how to understand Islam. I mean, one of the ones that I like a lot, for instance, he says, it is a good deed to increase someone's love for uh, God, but it is also a good deed to decrease someone's hatred towards God or religion or however you see it, or you can take it in, in, in any topic. He doesn't only see that any positive action that results in increasing the uh, popularity of a topic or an issue or, 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 or in this case, religion or God, but also decreasing that uh, 
uh, or, or decreasing that hatred among groups of people is a good deed. So for instance, let's say talk about dialogue. Uh, uh, dialogue is not, according to this principle, only aims to increase the, the love between communities. It also is dialogue when you decrease the hatred between communities. So that's a, a, a good way of looking at it. And that actually uh, is, is one of the uh, well, uh, well-known principles that he's met people remind each other about. And Yunus Emre is similar. It's a, it's a, he has lived in similar times with the Rumi and he has a, 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 a huge poetry that people keep reciting in terms of, for instance, the nonviolence reaction is very much affected by uh, Yunus Emre and his way of seeing it. In one poetry, he put it down. Uh, he is armless when he is hit. He can't hit back. You know the you know the dervish that Yunus Emre defines can't hit back other people. Or when he's cursed, he's tongueless. He can't curse people back. So the reaction is very peaceful, uh, nonviolent. In fact, non-reactionary in many times. But there is so many poetries that any common Turkish person would know. And when you recite, you, it's almost like pushing a button in his historical luggage, and he would understand an issue in a different way. So this part really affected how Hizmet operates. Uh, of course, I haven't mentioned a lot of other sources. These are the most notable people, but there are proverbs, the, the, the way of thinking Turkish the way of timekeeping as a Turkish, the way of prioritizing things uh, according to Turkish people, all these things has affected, at least up to now, the, the, the current uh, model that is in front of us as is met movement. So these are uh, historical principles, and there is a huge list of them. I think I have listed almost 40 of them as an example and from various other places. There is some from Alvar Lefe, which is uh, Fethullah Gulen's uh, teacher. And he has some poetry that defines humility and other stuff. And people actually express themselves via that poetry till uh, almost uh, not claims, but what would be the right word? That poetry based axioms almost like people assume these are correct. You know, they don't challenge these sayings and poetry. So this has a lot of effect. And the last one is, is contextual principles. So I will move from here how actually his met movement adopted or responded, or people in 19, 1960s and 70s responded to the social crisis around themselves and emerged what we call today's his met movement. But it mainly gives a, a huge area at the end, you know, apart from your Islamic motivation your cultural heritage, your historical heritage and principles and luggage, however you take it, sometimes a good thing, sometimes a bad thing. In the practical operation of things and on the field, you have to always follow what is the co what context is and what is needed. For instance, in, in certain places, the hunger is a big problem and you try to solve that. In some places, uh, let's say, Xenophobia is a big problem, you encourage dialogue. In some places, war is a problem and you try to promote peace. And in some other places, ignorance is the biggest problem, you try to promote education. In fact, Said Dinursi make these sort of a big uh, claim that the biggest problem at that time in his time was ignorance, poverty, and discrimination. And any good action, any hizmet should actually try to eradicate this. Any good Muslim should try to work to resolve these issues. And nowadays, these are changing. And you can see that debate is shifting within even his movement as well. Like environmental issues are a big issue. So uh, people think that it has to be part of it. Uh, uh, very recently, a, a, a notable Hizmet uh, institution declared a new set of principles. And it's uh, the biggest uh, emphasis in on human rights. And that is understandable for various reasons. Now, this is the last part. And it differs in Lithuania, whatever the society and whatever the context in there, uh, people try to be relevant and helpful and solve whatever they see a problem or at least contribute to solution of any problem they see. Of course, there is a huge template of this ignorance, poverty and 
uh, discrimination related topics, which we call dialogue, education, and charity activities. But when it comes to particulars of an application, you will see, let's say, any Hizmet school would be operating within the law of the country according to their needs and according to their regulations. Now, I'll try to take it a bit of history of Hizmet movement. So I am at the 20 minutes, so I'll try to spend as much uh, as little time as possible to move on and give some more time for Q&A. So this is where it's all started, you know, of, although Fethullah Gulen has a time uh, he, where he served before his military service in Edirne, we often take at the beginning of his med movement is back to this mosque where he was stationed as an imam. And he was also a teacher for a, a, a Quranic school, a madrasa, at a religious school nearby uh, attached to this mosque, and where he raised his first pupils, some of them are which is still with him. And also, uh, I choose this picture. Also, this mosque was within community. He was engaging and trying to be in touch with the local shopkeepers and other people and try to bring them in, or if they don't come, he used to go to them and he was positively engaging a young, ambitious or idealist imam at that time. So Kestane Pazarı in Izmir, the western, the most western part of the Turkey, uh, from a very, very different background uh, where Gulen came from, which is almost the most eastern part of Turkey. In fact, the most eastern, one of the most eastern borders of Turkey. Uh, Gulen, uh, after his military service in his station, he tried to engage uh, the problems of the people, the grassroots on, on uh, the community in there. And one of those problems in five to 10 years, apart from giving good s speeches, integrating uh, religion and science together and addressing the current topics like uh, evolution and other issues, and in fact, campaigning for, let's say, a, a, a green uh, air, like he was uh, famously known for setting up an anti-smoking campaign. He, in 1970s, realized there is a huge uh, wave of urbanization. A lot of young kids from the villages, from the rural areas coming to the cities to be educated, but they don't have support. They don't have support from their families. Not everyone is rich and wealthy uh, from agriculture and stuff. A lot of poor people come and try their luck and they need accommodation. So the one very first social project he undertook was to open dormitories for those kids who came from, uh, who came from uh, rural villages and their problem. What he did is he, he already knew people on the street, uh, shopkeepers who wanted to do good stuff. And he said, why don't you just look after these students, open a dormitory, let them stay in a safe environment so they can uh, become teachers and other you know, professions and be helpful to society. This is part of your religion and, and part of a good deed as well. So that is uh, what those people did. And then Later on, it, the, these are not necessarily following, but if you see, this is the first uh, first episode, no, first journal, no, first the part of the uh, magazine, first the unit, no, volume of the uh, famous magazine called Susan Tim, and it is 1979, uh, just just before the just before the sorry. Just before the uh, 1980s, uh, Gulen decided to have their own, uh, ha establish their own uh, media outlet, magazines and newspapers mainly. And later on, we, we, we see that, you know, that, that, that means like he see a problem. Actually, the problem was everything was very political. Uh, if you remember, some of you might remember the, the Cold War era, everything was communist versus United uh, Capitalists and divided into two and stuff. So he wanted to establish a slightly less political, but bring science and religion together in a, in a, in a magazine. So he had to establish his own magazine, which survived until the coup uh, and, and until it has been shut down by the government and, and probably most copies are destroyed. And so he entered, he saw a need and he, he, he addressed that need by opening a, a new channel in there, let's say. 
Later on, in 1980s, some of you will remember uh, Reagan or Thatcher times where everything was getting out of government hands, privatization, private companies were encouraged and everything. Uh, at that time, Gulen had to, uh, there was a coup in Turkey in 1980 and Gulen was, uh, was, was warranted but they, but by the military leaders of the coup. So he was effectively on the run. And he had a chance to see the whole country from a very different point of view, where he realized the ignorance is a big problem and the Muslims should invest in uh, opening uh, secular schools to help uh, mass education. So this was a radical idea for a religious group to open dormitories seems okay, but opening secular schools, not Islamic schools, not Imam Hatibs, not madrasas, but secular schools, uh, was was radical, but somehow that discussion uh, ha has ended in favor of Gulen and they set up secular schools. This is the very first school. And then later on supplementary schools, which actually created a lot of upward social mobilization in Turkey. That is why we are having this big trouble in Turkey now, almost like a, a reaction to that upward social mobilization, which shouldn't have happened according to some people in Turkey. Uh, so now 1985, uh, Gulen group or Hizmet movement has schools, they are seeing a problem in the country and they are responding to it. So later on that media has developed into uh, from, let's say, science and religious magazines into political newspapers, which is trying to uh, give a different way of uh, engaging with politics or, and, or, or TV channels. Again, this is the right time to, to invest it, to go into that area famous Zaman newspaper, again, shut down and, uh, by the current regime in Turkey. Anyway, in 1991, when the Soviet Union this, uh, uh, was dissolved, uh, Gulen encouraged people to support your, uh, I'm, I'm using this Turkish nationalistic way of explaining this, your brothers and sisters in the Central Asia. So there was an expansion in 1991 towards the Central Asia. Sorry about the typo in there. And uh, so Gulen encouraged his followers to go and uh, establish schools or businesses and other places, whatever those people need in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan and other places. So this is the first time the movement become uh, an, a, a, an international uh, movement or uh, I would call it like transnational movement. And later, Gulen followed this in a few years later when he retired from, the, uh, from his position in the religious affairs as well. He moved this to in the Balkans. So there is a sense of like these people are under your care. When they were part of Ottoman, they were your brothers and sisters. So you should go and help them as well. Not only Eastern brothers and sisters by your blood, but also by your culture. There are other brothers and sisters in the Balkan area you should help them as well. So, and then it turns into a more global uh, vision, but uh, gradually people start to travel all around the world and his met movement in 2000 uh, and onwards become uh, actually chosen aim to be every, every country in the world if possible. And they manage to open schools and education institutions or businesses or, or charity organization or dialogue organization uh, in 160 countries in the rest of the world. So this is the expansion and transnationalization of the movement. So the dialogue actually came in, a, in stages as well. So this is mainly what I talked so far was actually how from the dormitories, from the mosque to dormitories, from there to media and other parts, but mainly the education and then the transnationalization with the education institutions. We have talked about that history, but now the dialogue actually came in uh, slightly later you know, in 1990s, there was a huge divide in Turkey and Gulen tried to, in the uh, right top corner, you see, try to bridge the community is in Turkey by holding iftar or uh, the fast breaking dinners with different parts of the communities and try to bring them. There was especially a huge potential of an Alevi Sunni division in Turkey. And he tried to bridge that gap. Then he saw another gap that the other religious minorities who are not accepted or not well known or not protected enough by Turkish popul population, 
because he's also now uh, retired as a religious affairs officer, he doesn't feel like a government or, or a state bureaucrat. He he's actually feels more free. So he starts to holding meetings with them, bringing them a, little, a bit more to the center of attention and, 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 and provide a little bit of acceptance. And with this uh, activities and projects, we see that Gulen had even a meeting with Pope which is a significant moment for the, the understanding of dialogue and what to expect from a dialogue. Because at that time, the Catholic Church was changing their understanding of dialogue. It, it coincided in the right time. And it shaped and defined the uh, 1995 and onwards, you know, after that period, defined the Hizmet movement and it is uh, engagement with the others all around the world. The dialogue become a main part of that uh, issues. Then one other thing after that happened, the charity. Charity issues again, because most Hizmet people used to think charity, you know, like helping people to educate themselves is the biggest form of charity. They used to collect scholarships for each student in need, and they used to uh, give that money to those students, support them in by providing dormitories or cheaper education or high quality education for free in certain circumstances. But uh, the charity as we know it started until the, the big earthquake in Turkey as an organizational level. So one of the big shout uh, when, when people when Turkey was uh, uh, hit by that big earth, earthquake, people used to shout, is there anyone there? And that becomes the title of a TV program in Hizmet uh, TV channel first and later a charity and become uh, you know, a, a global uh, charity foundation of its own that particularly was very active in, in, in the most needed path according to whatever is the need, but let's see. So all these activities was continuing then the uh, 15th of July, there has been a coup attempt in Turkey. There has been a coup attempt in Turkey and in that coup attempt, a lot of things changed. I, I, I don't have a huge script about this uh, for this part, but I, I, list, I at least want to start the conversation here because it's a huge information to, to process here. What happened is whatever happened on that night, that was blamed for uh, Gulen and his, his friends or the Hizmet movement. And they have been accused and, and uh, persecuted for this coup attempt with uh, with their entirety. So there is a website. I'm not sure whether it's going to show, but I think it's a good idea to share. I will just quickly change this. That is Turkey Purge. You can go and have a detailed look yourself. I can. Yeah, okay. So what happened after the coup attempt is thousands of people are purged from mainly government positions. Uh, the, the the estimation is that there is almost like six. 100,000 people have been investigated uh, and 150,000 people are dismissed from their uh, state uh, related jobs or public offices. Th uh, 94,000, almost 95,000 people are arrested. These numbers are updated regularly. 3,000 schools and dormitories and universities and other education institutions are shut down. 6,000 academics, just higher education related jobs are lost, you know, meaning they were per either purged or they were working in those institutions. 4,500 judges and prosecutors dismissed. Uh, 189 media outlets, big and small, are uh, shut down. 319 journalists are arrested. So these are January to, you know, like to at least a month old figures. And they have all the uh, government decrees that individually that this list all these people and their problems and and uh, what happened is uh, i'll just uh, well i'll keep this uh, screen on for a while uh, what happened is actually on that night there has been like 8000 military personnel take part in, in military action we don't know their motivation According to British uh, Parliament report, which I have had a chance to contribute to as well, is uh, it's a co co it's a coalition of uh, various groups in the army did something, but it was more. This is my part. It's nothing British Parliament report. 
but it was more useful for Erdogan to use this as a way out for, for his own corruption allegations and other problems and turn this into a scapegoat issue and blame uh, his political rivals, especially his met movement, and start persecuting people based on that affiliation. So a lot of people have been persecuted based on this affiliation, not necessarily because of they have uh, committed any crime. Uh, what we call this has happened in a social purge, meaning like people when they per uh, kicked out of their jobs, they weren't allowed to work in other private uh, places as well. They weren't given health uh, uh, or, or well, health services uh, for free as they, they were supposed to. They didn't necessarily have uh, fair trials and they're not necessarily having fair trials. This again, most recently British uh, Home Office has done a, an updated report on this issue. Almost all detentions and arrests are unlawful, even according to Turkish law, because there isn't really a crime. The, the crime is based on, okay, you have used this uh, Hizmet Movement affiliated bank accounts, or, or you have a bank account in that bank, which was legal, no problem, or you were watching this TV channels, or you were subscribed to this uh, journals or newspapers. Uh, all based on these affiliations, people being blamed of being part of a terrorist organization, not necessarily shown mm -hmm. any reason or, 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 or any specific uh, action that took part. And we know there has been a, a systematic torture. Uh, it, it used to be peaking in terms of like really hard, brutal torture, but there is a huge amount of uh, still torture and abuse of human rights, like not giving people enough time to prepare their defenses or all other uh, related issues. And there is huge amount of trauma and suicide related victims in the uh, uh, from that period. I better share at this time my screen again, if you can. Okay, and my teacher, Matt's teacher, who was a very from a very poor background, uh, managed to graduate from the top university of maths in, in, in Turkey. Uh, and, and the story is so sad. He, I, we, we used to know him because he was a legend among us. He, he taught us very well in high school. He used to eat uh, people's leftovers. That, that is how uh, of, of a low background he was. With this coup attempt, when he was purged, he tried to give private lessons and this and that, but there was a stigma attached to that being purged by the government decree. And there is a, so much propaganda and fear about it that he couldn't do. And what happened is uh, with, with a lot of families, uh, they have divorced maybe as a, as, a, as a mean to try to separate trouble from the family sort of a reason. And then with other financial constraints, and I don't know what, what else, I have heard that he commits suicide later on because of all these troubles and problems. He was a very bright mind. And uh, I had actually, uh, I had actually took part uh, when I was in high school uh, to, to mock his teaching style uh, in, a, in, a, in a theater of, of the high school. And he, he lent me his own uh, jacket for it. So I, I, I can pretend like him. He was such a nice person. He's among uh, 657 or something maybe increased now, uh, people who commit suicide or killed uh, under detention. Or, uh, these are civilian people. Uh, these are almost bystanders to any, 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 that, any issue that happened in Turkey. And a huge majority of people become refugees since then. So I am aware of my time and Sorry. Okay. And, 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 and huge number of people become refugees. And that is, that doesn't mean only from Turkey. Uh, in some Middle Eastern, Central Asian and African countries where Erdogan used legal, illegal uh, means to abduct people and bring them to Turkey to boost his political support. Uh, a lot of people from those places have to migrate from Western democracies as well. Uh, much safer places. A lot of people have their passports finished uh, and the government or Turkish state refused to uh, replace them, uh, make them effectively stateless. 
a lot of people have their children who, who doesn't still have passports of their own country. If they manage to come to a, a safe place, they might have some, uh, some sort of a, uh, maybe identification now. So there is other impacts which I am not uh, totally prepared. Like for instance, the, there is huge decrease in nationalism. What I talked about, for instance, earlier, the huge part of this movement was about that. Uh, but, uh, you know, and there is a huge number of, uh, you know, decrease in social stature. There is a, a, a shift in mindsets in the people. Uh, there is a, 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 an inclination towards from transnational movement to a more global movement. But it's, these are on the very early stages of the, uh, of the transition. Uh, I think we can discuss all these issues as a Q&A session. Thank you very much for uh, listening. I think that would be my presentation and hope this was in any way helpful.